Hello! I'm Carrie. I cosplay, crochet, and enjoy history bounding. I have also been an instructor and volunteer with St. John Ambulance for almost 15 years. The combination of these interests is part of the reason why I'm recreating a World War I St. John Ambulance VAD uniform. In this video, I want to go over a bit of information about the VAD, their uniform, so you know what I'm trying to recreate. This all started years ago when my mother and I were watching The Mirror Cracked, Agatha Christie's murder mystery, the one with um, Elizabeth Taylor and Angela Lansbury. Spoiler alert, it's a St. John Ambulance volunteer who gets murdered. And my mother casually remarked that I should recreate that uniform. Nope, I did not have anywhere near the skill necessary to even attempt to recreate that, so I promptly just pushed that to the back of my mind and didn't think about it for years. Then, maybe six years ago, that conversation came to mind again. Probably because I was watching another Agatha Christie murder mystery. I did a quick Google search for St. John Ambulance historic uniform. <laughs> came up with a lot of variety in that search. There was one image from 1908 that really captivated me. It was so different than anything else that I've seen our volunteers wearing. I couldn't find any more information about the uniform at that specific time, but as I tried to research it, I kept stumbling across information about what the organization was doing during World War I. And the more I looked into it, the more intrigued I was. I don't know exactly when, why, how I came to the decision that I'm going to recreate that, but here I am recreating a World War I St. John Ambulance VAD uniform. I've been researching this now for a number of years, and I'm still researching. I've read a number of books, looked at websites, watched documentaries, read newspaper articles, research articles, looked at information online at museums, gone to a museum, information about St. John Ambulance at the time, general information about the VAD, what was going on in the war, fashion at the time, knitting and sewing practices of the time, information on the St. John Hospital in Etap, and of course information on each part of the uniform that I'm going to need to recreate, and information on the trained nurses at the time. Okay, first piece of information, VAD stands for Voluntary Aid Detachment. That could refer to an entire unit, or one individual person. Since I'm trying to get as much information as I can, I have been looking at not just information in Canada, but about St. John Ambulance VADs in the UK as well. The original picture that sparked interest in recreating this uniform was from 1908. So we're looking at lead up to the war. And people were aware with the way politics were going that it was pushing them towards a war. And the UK knew they did not have anywhere near enough medical staff to be able to deal with the wounded that a war would create. Nursing was still a very young profession at this point. They didn't have anywhere near enough trained nurses. Women took not just first aid courses, but courses in home nursing. Male volunteers also learned about patient transportation and they had weekly training and meetings. The Joint War Committee was created to organize the resources of both St. John Ambulance and the Red Cross so that they could efficiently and effectively recruit volunteers, train them, set uniform guidelines, and then of course deploy those volunteers. One of the great resources that are available are war diaries of some of the women that served as VAD nurses. Museums. Another great source of information, and thankfully, most of them have started putting a lot of information online. The Imperial War Museum in London has a lot of great resources online. They have pictures of VADs working in hospitals. When I first started researching this, 
they did not have any images up of the St. John Ambulance VAD uniforms that they had. They now do. And they have a lot of good information in terms of size measurements, the material that it's made of, um, and sometimes little extra details in there that are very helpful. Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. They have an excellent uniform. That is my goal. Hopefully this summer things can calm down enough that I can actually arrange to go and see their St. John Ambulance VAD uniform from World War I and get some measurements, figure out, okay, what color gray is this thing? Get a little peek in terms of the construction of it. The Great War Center in Montreal. We actually went to that museum March 2020 as all of this mayhem was blowing up. They are a small museum and because they don't have their collection on display, like most museums under glass, they have volunteers show you around their museum. And because I was doing research for creating this uniform, they pulled down things and let me see them. One of the things specifically that they brought out to show me was a triangular bandage and printed on it was like a textbook, all of the different ways that you can use your triangular bandage. They showed me the inside of some of the uniforms so I could take pictures of the construction of it. They had a Red Cross VAD uniform, same thing, like they really turned things inside out for me so I could take pictures, measurements. They were very, very helpful. Who were the VAD? They were men and women aged 21 to 48. Usually though, they were on the younger side. They were expected to be unmarried. VAD had to be of independent means. The VADs had to have enough money to buy or make their uniform. And it wasn't just one uniform. There were stipulations for how many of each item, the dress, the veil, the apron, that they had to have. What did the VADs do? Most people are aware of the VAD nurse but VADs did a number of jobs to help support the professional medical staff and help ensure the smooth running of the hospitals. The idea was to relieve some of the workload from the nurses so that the trained nurses can do what only they could do. They could be clerks doing administrative work, paperwork in the hospitals. In the kitchens, they would cook, clean, serve meals, a hospital. There's a lot of cleaning that needs to be done. They were also ambulance drivers. They washed and rolled bandages, handed out care packages, worked with the Red Cross to support uh, missing and wounded soldier services. Oftentimes the trained nurses didn't have time to provide the niceties of some emotional comfort. The VADs would read letters from home, write letters for patients who couldn't, distribute care packages. So if a soldier needed socks, they would get socks from the Red Cross care packages and sometimes just sitting and chatting with a soldier. Providing comfort and kindness might be the reason that the VAD nurses were known as Tommy's favorites. VAD also worked in the pharmacies of the hospitals. They would get medication ready, give that medication to the nurses for the nurses to distribute, or if they had proven themselves competent, they could be trained as well on how to deliver medication. Patient care, all of the soldiers needed to be cleaned up coming off the front, so they had to be bathed thoroughly. They would dress their wounds, clean the wounds, change the dressings, apply compresses, help patients get outside for fresh air and sunshine, take temperatures, monitor symptoms, and sometimes just watch over patients and let the nurses know if things got worse. They would help get the soldiers ready to board the hospital train to either go back to the front or to a convalescent hospital. But it did work. The VAD did reduce the workload of the trained nurses so that the trained nurses could provide that higher level of care. And the VADs had time to provide those emotional comforts to the patients. So why am I doing all of this research 
to recreate a uniform? Historic costuming isn't just about looking at a picture and winging it. You need to understand all of the layers that had to be worn to get the silhouette right. If I were to simply measure the skirt length of an Exodent uniform, my skirt would be scandalously short because I'm so tall. There are often practical, political, societal reasons for why clothing, or in this case a uniform, is the way it is. And understanding that helps really understand and make a better garment when you understand why. And I want to enter this into competition, so I need to be able to prove that what I have recreated is as historically accurate as I can make it. The elements of the uniform. For what is visible, you have the dress, veil, collar, apron, arm covers, and brassard. Outdoor uniform, travel uniform, just on the home front, you could wear a sweater or coat and hat. The underlayers, you have combinations, corset, corset cover, stockings, and petticoat. The dress. The Canadian resources that I found said that the dress was grey wool. In the UK, it said grey chambray type of cotton. The skirt length, for practicality's sake, was shorter. One source said an inch off the ground. Another source said two inches, again for practicality of movement and keeping it clean. The dress is not supposed to be flattering. It is supposed to be basically just a sack with a belt. They did not want the VAD involved in any hospital romances. Could I have pockets? You know I'm gonna add pockets to this. The buttons were covered by a placard so that when bathing or providing care, moving patients, the buttons would not rub up against the skin of the patients. The veil, well, at the start of the war, they wore a Dora cap, and then sometime in 1915, it switched to the veil. Again, trying to give that angelic, holy, untouchable impression. The VADs had the veil pinned at the neck. The apron, very practical for keeping the dress clean, had to be nice, beautiful, and white. And you're probably wondering how they keep those aprons nice and white when sloshing through the mud, dealing with blood. They were starched. All of the white parts of the uniform were starched. So the dirt and blood and grime would stick to the starch. When you wash it, the starch comes off easily and the blood and dirt comes off with the starch. And then of course you restarch them. I have found some images where the Maltese cross of the Order of St. John is embroidered on the apron. Others don't seem to have it. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to put that on the one I make. Again, practicality of pockets. And it buttoned at the back so that there would not be something rubbing against the patient's skin. The brassard, this is what helped identify different members in terms of which organization they were part of. They were held in place with elastic. Part of me would like to be able to hand embroider this, but I don't know if that's gonna happen. There's a lot of tiny detail and beautiful, neat printing. Arm covers, again, white, kept clean because of the starch. They secure above the elbow with ties. The arm covers were only worn when they were working. A sweater. I have crocheted a 1917 sweater shawl. It was the first vintage pattern that I found, and it happened to be crochet. So of course I had to make it. It doesn't fit perfectly because I am so tall, so I might try to make something else, but I have a sweater if I need it. On the home front, the sweater would only be worn when going from home to the hospital. Overseas, depending upon the weather, yes, they were allowed to wear them when working. The outdoor uniform, the coat is just a nice long great coat, has a cute hat. I have not decided yet whether or not I want to make those. Well, I mean, I want to, but I've never made a coat. That's going to mean learning to work with thicker fabric. We'll see. Underpinnings. First layer would be the combinations, which is a combination chemise and drawers. It's kind of like a onesie, a vintage onesie. Buttons up at the front. The drawers are open for ease of necessities. 
going to the bathroom. Corset? Yes, because of shortage of metal. Some women were not wearing corsets at this time or starting to not wear corsets. But the VAD were expected to wear corsets. It was still considered that respectable women wore corsets. Some women, I'm sure, if their corset still fit, an older Edwardian corset would be worn, which might still have steel boning. But newer corsets could be supported with quills, cording, whalebone. I've done one mock-up of the corset. I have to do more. The stockings were black. They were knit out of either silk or fine wool. And yes, I am going to try to knit my own stockings. The corset cover, of course, goes over the corset, helps smooth out the line so that you don't see, bloop, I'm wearing a corset. I am currently crocheting a 1915 corset cover. Petticoat. If a VAD was making their own petticoat during the war, it would probably be much plainer because there was fabric rationing. Probably couldn't get all of the nice frilly trims. But again, if using an existing petticoat, might have some lace on it. Haven't decided yet. It might also depend upon what I had in my fabric stash. My challenges. Despite doing all of this research, I still have some questions and a number of challenges ahead of me that I'm going to have to deal with as I recreate this uniform. The big one, what is gray? The pictures were all black and white. It doesn't really tell me what color the uniform was. And because the VADs could make their own uniform, they weren't all the same material. So there was some variation there. Even looking at accident garments, the front could have sun damage and be faded. That's part of why I want to look at an accident garment and see the inside where there might be less fading. Until I see one of those, I'm considering the color based upon contemporary artwork, like the VAD recruiting poster. And I have seen a painting of a VAD in uniform. My skills. That is the big one that I need to improve upon. Knitting. I know how to do a knit stitch. I know how to purl. That, that's about it. If I'm going to hand embroider the brassard, I really need to work on that. If I decide to make the coat, I have no experience working with heavier material. There's still going to be a huge learning curve that needs to happen. And I am probably going to need mock-up after mock-up after mock-up after mock-up. What about historic methods? Do I want to sew this on a modern machine? I might have to for if I'm doing the coat. Or do I attempt to do this on the treadle sewing machine that my husband found for me? Then I have to learn how to use the treadle. I still have lots to learn, but I'm looking forward to showing you pieces of this uniform as I make them. So that is what I'm recreating. With vaccines being rolled out and conventions starting to get rolling again, I think I need the push of a deadline to really get working on this. I'm looking at hopefully putting this into competition for Costume Con 2023. That's two years away. Hopefully I can do this. If you want more information on the research that I've been doing, check out the link to my Facebook page in the description. If you want to see the development of this costume as I go along, make sure you subscribe. If you don't see me posting video of me working on this project, comment and remind me that I need to get my button gear. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Until next time, have fun and be creative. Oh, that was so much talking. And I've actually done this presentation live over Zoom to some St. John Ambulance volunteers. That was somehow easier than this. Go figure.